straight into our first keynote with Dr. Aiden as he speaks about higher education on the brink of transformation. Aiden is a lecturer in academic development with the University of South Australia. He completed his PhD with Flinders University titled Student Advocacy um, in Higher Education, the Possibility of Politics of Students' Role in um, Hegemonic University Change. He is an active researcher in higher education, including an active student participation and students as partners um, and programmatic uh, approaches, appro yep, approaches to Aboriginal content and pedagogies, um, multi and transdisciplinary education and structural transformation of education systems. All yours, Aidan. Go for it. Thanks very much, Sadef, and very sorry for that mouthful of a bio from me, as well as a mouthful of a thesis title. Um, give me two seconds and hopefully uh, my screen share will pop up for you and I'm just going to move that chat out of the way just so that I can keep an eye on if there's any questions as we go. All right, thank you very much and so great to see many new faces um, today. I've been a long time participant in Student Voice events as a student um, and so now it's a real privilege to come back as a, um, on the other side of things as an academic uh, to sort of see this ongoing legacy of this awesome thinking and working that you will do in your various roles. Um, so my session today is called Rethink or Revolutionise. I'm going to be a little bit radical and I'm going to try not to be too theoretical um, at, you know, this early in the morning, but please forgive me if, um, you know, if things sort of move into that space, I'm predisposed to thinking a little bit radically and a little bit theoretically, but hopefully there'll be useful lessons for your practice. Before I go further, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, lands which were never ceded. I'd like to pay my respect to those that walked before, elders past and present, and acknowledge their ongoing connection to country, tradition, community, knowledge, lands, seas, and sky. And of course, I'd like to expect, res, extend my respects to any First Nations colleagues with us here today. Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I think importantly as well, as I sort of start to get into this space, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people, particularly as custodians of knowledge and traditional ways of thinking, working and doing uh, across the Adelaide region. Um, and of course, different um, Aboriginal groups and Torres Strait Islander groups around Australia as sort of phenomenal holders of knowledge and sharers and transmitters and thinkers and learners and teachers. Um, and I think that's a really important space for us to think about. Changing tack a little bit. So I wanted to start with a quote, and I assume many people will have seen this um, this quote from Doris Lessing before. Um, it's a it's an interesting one that sort of provokes your thinking around what what is it that an education does, and it, this is sort of in the context of quite a broad sense of what an education is, can be, and does. But she says, and I'll just read to you: "You're in the process of being indoctrinated." We have not yet evolved a system of education that is not a system of indoctrination. We're sorry, but it's the best we can do. What you're being taught here is an amalgam of current prejudice and choices of a particular culture. The slightest look at history will show imp how impermanent these must be. I'm going to stop there because I think that this, this quote sort of gives us a bit of a frame for understanding what the work of a higher education institution is and what our roles collectively might be within that as students and staff of higher education institutions, both universities and TAFEs. And I want to go a little bit meta with this. I want to talk about what our institutions are. And I think I want to really emphasize something that particularly in my context, so I work across um, the University of South Australia in a range of different contexts, talking to different academics, talking to different students, and really trying to understand the way that our systems and processes work and how education is happening and whether students are actually having an active say in that. And so our institutions, these things that we often refer to in, in this sort of, you know, a, a separate thing from us. There's something else, you know, we say the institution said, or the institution has decided. And we talk about it as if it's its own thing, its own agency with its own autonomy. And I think actually, sometimes we forget that institutions are comprised of people. Some of those people exhibit agency and others, maybe not so much. What do I mean by agency? I mean people like you who've joined this conference today, who are talking about different ways of working from inside their institution, or perhaps maybe are a bit more activist, um, forming rallies and protests and doing other kinds of you know, letter writing and all kinds of different things. So there's a range of different ways that we kind of 
exercise what we do. And it can also be captured really simply. So agency really simply could be the choice of not submitting your assignment on time and knowing that there might be a penalty for that, but really you'll probably be okay in the end. Others are really rule bound and really locked into a way of thinking where they kind of feel as though they need to respond or they've been historically conditioned to respond to the rules, legislations, regulations, requirements, and so on. And this is really disproportionate. So particularly for white, Western, Anglo people in Australia, there's a lot more room to be agentive, to bend the rules, to stretch and change how we respond to things. For others, that complicity is just a way of life, a way of getting by without being punished effectively. Through our institutions, we enact different ways of learning, working and doing. So institutions are responsible for some good stuff as well. It's not just that they condition our thinking into these certain ways and that that's all terrible. They actually help us think in new ways and work in new ways together. History conditions some of those ways that we think about our institutions. So they set some boundaries around us. So history kind of tells us through structures like laws or policies about what we can or perhaps should do and what we shouldn't do. Unfortunately, many of those boundaries are often sexist, ableist, classist, and so on. And structurally, our institutions, be they TAFEs, be they universities, they're established as an act or a function of state and territory parliament, or in the case of TAFEs, often federal parliament. In this instance, what we have is an institution which is fundamentally political. So the universities were, in Australia particularly historically, set up as a space to educate people who would then go on to be politicians, CEOs, um, you know, in legislative positions, lawyers, doctors, nurses, you know, all those kind of professional roles. And so in that, there's a politics of preserving a particular way of working and thinking. So universities and TAFEs as an educational apparatus serve two really big functions. And I think these two, there's many more, but these two are of importance for us this, this morning. The first is that they sustain an educated and skilled intellectual middle class typically who are capable of a great deal of things, but are often through education actually dissuaded from doing some of those great things, but others go on to do many amazing things. And the continuation of often colonial, often class, often hierarchical, often gendered, often ableist structures, which form the roots of our Western civilization. And I don't wanna to get too, too, too radical just yet. So bear with me. For better, though often for worse, our education institutions reproduce certain knowledge systems, ways of behaving, priorities, and social order through our education system. So be that school, be that university, be that TAFE, be that other kinds of education, like corporate education, training providers, and things like that, and even community education. They all serve kind of two functions. Often one is preparing for like a professional interaction, some kind of job or some kind of outcome, but also preparing us to work in a particular culture and to culture a particular way of work in us. This is all built simultaneously on, in Australia, a history of colonization and exploitation, and broadly on a maintenance of the status quo, because for white, predominantly middle and upper class people, wealthy people, and so on, this system works okay. And so universities are, for some of it, pretty complicit in reproducing some of these narratives, but also lifting a lot of people to be able to have a say in those narratives. And I think powerful education is in this space of enabling people to come in, understand what a university is doing, but then go on to be able to sort of influence change and make things better for more people. And there's an, there's an awesome power in that. But we have been in a bit of a place of stasis and particularly over the last few years with COVID, um, we've seen a real sort of stasis and um, not a lot of social change, particularly in our higher education institutions. And representatives, activists, partners, and so on are often dismissed. If you try and advance a radical uh, message, like somewhat like you might argue I'm doing right now, people will say, no, no, you're not really thinking. You're not really understanding this institution or this structure or why we do these things in this way. You're just being a radical. You know, you'll grow out of it. You know, by the time you're 50, you'll think differently about things. Personally, had that straight from a vice chancellor in the past. 
But I think we've got a lot of problems in higher ed, and these are just a random few splattering of articles, but we've seen a lot of issues in our higher education institutions across these last three years, but across the last 10, 20, 30 years. And it doesn't kind of feel like there's a lot going on to fight and change it right now. And there's little pockets of people doing amazing work in all of these spaces. And I would imagine most of the people in this conference today have either come up against issues that they are chipping away at changing or have changed or know of some serious issues that are going on. We've seen things like massive restructuring, cuts to courses, climbing fees, changes to the funding model that punish students for failing, um, first year courses, for example. All kinds of different problems have come up. I don't just want to be doom and gloom. So let me now do what I said that I wouldn't do and get into a little bit of theory just for a second. Um, in the 1910s and 1920s, there was this guy called Antonio Gramsci, and he was an Italian theorist um, and uh, social scientist of a, of a kind. He had, like me, I think, probably some quite radical ideas, uh, except that he was facing very serious fascism in Italy during that time um, and leading up to World War I and then subsequently World War II. Because of the ideas that he had about making life better for people through education, he was put in prison by his government. So I'm one step up on Gramsci at the moment because I'm not yet in prison, uh, which is a nice benefit. Um, but he wrote a lot of amazing and compelling theory, basically on the back of scraps of pieces of paper and then handing them out the window to friends that they would go and compile his works later on. So he was working under some very trying conditions. But he observed some things that are really interesting for us, I think, uh, generally as a society to think about. He said that we can really actually think about our social order in two major groups. So he asserted, and this is, of course, not one way of thinking, um, not only one, it's just one sort of piece of the puzzle. There's many different conceptions that are really similar to this. But that ultimately, there is one sort of group of people who have the ultimate power in society. He called this political society, or at least the English translation of his Italian writing calls this political society. I think it might be um, better to sort of conceptualize this as those with power. And then everybody else was in civil society. I kind of like that as a frame, you know, civilians, um, people who are just sort of working and living and being you know, in the world. In political society, this is not politicians. It's not Anthony Albanese. It's not Scott Morrison. It's people who comprise any kind of powerful institution. So CEOs, vice chancellors, business leaders, politicians, public speakers, um, TV uh, personalities, and so on. There's a whole lot of people that have certain kinds of power, possibility, and control and perspective in this what Gramsci called political society, or we could call ruling class, perhaps. When you think about society in this way, you can see that there's groups of people that have a vested interest in the system working the way it does. For example, we can think about multi-millionaires or multi-billionaires who are elevated to a point in our society where they have amassed an enormous amount of power and control, and they want to do what they can in order to try and keep things pretty much the way that they are, because it benefits them. And universities, and in fact, education historically has been one of the places where this has continued, this has been um, dragged across um, as, a, as a space of reproducing that it's okay that only you know, one or 2% of people control a lot of the decisions, the power, the money, the authority, the culture of our societies. So education works then to reproduce at least some of what's happening in that political society space. And that's not all bad, but it's worth us critically reflecting on. And so Gramsci really called for us to think about where we are, where we're positioned, you know, what can we do? What actions can we take? And how can we make things better for everyone around us? Not just our fellow students, but also people in the rest of that civil society. You know, who else can we talk to, influence, um, educate, work with, and so on. And so one of the really important tools that Gramsci really highlights for us, theoretically speaking, is the tool that is education. So education itself often conveys particular values, ways of thinking, as I kind of flagged. But also education is really powerful. When you can have a conversation with somebody and both parties walk away from that conversation feeling like they've learned something new, there's, there's real potential for change in that. And I think that's the real power of things like student partnership, where together with 
you know, teachers and students and students and students and students and community and so on. There's a lot of conversations that happen and a lot of reciprocal mutual learning that can take place. So there's really important and powerful tools in education. It's about how we use them and what we do with them. So what is reproduced, Gramsci would say, is not fixed. And there are really good examples of that currently out there in the world. Lots of these are quite activist, but lots of them are really gradual and small changes. So over time, what our dominant understandings are have changed, they have shifted. The broad social structure, any historians in the Zoom call will know, you know, we've, we've changed the way that we um, economically structure our societies across different um, groups and continents and different spaces, particularly thinking around shifts from, you know, feudalism where we had lords um, and we, you know, everybody was sort of subservient to a, some kind of ruler, be that a king or a prince or what have you. Um, towards this sort of capitalist mode, which arguably did sort of diversify and broaden participation in who could have power, though maybe not that much. But also in the big cultural and social movements across the last hundred years or so, I'm thinking particularly um, victories of feminism, so enabling women to vote, uh, being one of those big ones, um, increasing things uh, like gay marriage and representation and things like that. Uh, and then contemporary uh, movements, things like Black Lives Matter and Aboriginal deaths in custody, which again has had an ongoing history and is making an impact. So it's not to say that because there's this political society, this group of people with immense power, that civil society can't make change. And in fact, the change that civil society makes eventually forces those in that group one, so just going back a second, those, those in group one, in the political society, that ruling class, eventually, if enough people in civil society take on a new way of working and operating, those in the political society end up having to go with the flow, otherwise they get chucked down. And that, I think we can see a really micro level at universities and TAFEs that have really adopted the student partnership model. So rather than in a lecture like this, where I talk at you for 40 minutes, um, we start to see a real equaling of, you know, students bringing perspectives and being able to teach themselves and each other, uh, and not just have some one person control all the knowledge and direct all of the learning. So these changes are not just about this radical political social change, but also about what's happening at that, that micro level. And I think we've all, again, everybody here will have had a role in something like that. If you think about, you know, what you've done in your life, you will have had some kind of impact in one of these spaces. Of course, it's important to note that not all of these big social victories, big social changes have been met with complicity, particularly from that political class. You know, often um, people are met with force. So you think about protesters, like thinking particularly uh, in Sydney with Black Lives Matter protesters you know, during COVID, they were met with massive police um, presence and things like that. So there's, there's sort of this controlling force that does tend to come up against those really what are deemed by political society to be quite radical movements. But also in academia, we can see that there's really sometimes quite narrow and restrictive control um, over what is taught and what gets valued. You know, I'm thinking particularly, you know, from my position um, in a university, looking at the way that Aboriginal knowledges and Aboriginal content and curriculum are embedded in our programs and courses. We're moving in the right direction, but it's still very narrow. And traditionally, higher education institutions have been very specific about wanting to have only a particular way of knowing, doing and working reproduced. But again, small victories chipping away. I think how we act in the face of some of these big global challenges, these big problems, and particularly things like changes to education, because I think, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. We know as, you know, staff and students of higher education institutions that education is a really important thing. And so particularly thinking about student protest around changes to education that either made it prohibitively expensive, sought to make um, students have to pay to attend, course cuts and changes like that creates you know, immense sort of traditional activists, activism in the form of picket protests and things like that. And the way that we respond, I think, can define us. But I don't think that that means that we always need to or have to go out and protest. And in fact, I think in some instances, protest itself has got a whole range of issues that prohibit some people from interacting and again, has more immense consequences for some groups rather than others. But I do think that in this sort of 
I'm going to um, copy a, a word from the the far right here. I'm going to say the the woke agenda. Um, in the the woke agenda, actually, I think this progressive thinking helps us to surpass what's happening in theory, particularly in legitimized higher education spaces. Right. So lots of this thinking around, you know. For example, giving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a voice in higher education curriculum, that is something that has not been well theorized except by a handful of traditionally Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scholars. But now activist pressure has moved universities and TAFEs in that direction. So I think actually I'm going to take you're not thinking you're just being radical as a compliment in this instance. But what does this all mean for education and what role maybe could education play in all of this? Is there a room for a socially connected education? I'm calling it socially education rather socially connected rather than activist education because I think there's a more palatable way of pitching this because activism sort of yields this image of like fist in air, out on the street, um, kind of social movement that I don't think it needs to unless conditions are quite dire. But actually, if we revisioned, re-envisioned education as a tool to create small social changes that led to more participation and more active participation for participants in higher education in society, we could get a long way without needing a protest. Also wanted to ask, well, I've got a lot of questions this morning. Um, is disciplinary thinking really helping in our global world? You know, we often, we sign up to do, for example, a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Health Science, and so on. And we, we are sort of in these sort of disciplinary silos. And I kind of wonder if, you know, the way that we sort of think about this, or even particularly um, trajectories towards careers, is that helping us have a broad base? I don't have an answer to that. And that's not to say that having a, you know, a graduate outcome at the end that some kind of work is a problem. I think that it, it absolutely isn't, but it's something that we can all collectively think about. Are the reproduced narratives about the social order in higher education working? And how could we change them if they're not? Just, you know, more questions. And really, who is actually responsible for making these changes? You know, who can do this? And I know, you know, obviously the knee-jerk response here is, you know, politicians should be making broad social change. And in a university context, you know, a vice chancellor at a TAFE, a director, um, these kinds of um, people should be in the position where they're creating things that are better for, in some arguments, the customers that they serve, in perhaps better arguments, the students that are partners that they serve and work with. But also I think that we all can play a role, and I certainly see sort of myself as, as one of the people who is responsible for creating and, and supporting this change, and, and hopefully, you know, as students, you are as well. But for transforming learning and teaching, which I think anybody who's working in a representative role, who's working in a partnership role, and so on, they're doing absolutely. For fixing problems in society, Maybe that's a broader leap. Maybe that's something we need more social enterprise to support us with. For transforming the reproduction, which serves the ruling elite. Sorry, getting a little bit more radical again. But also thinking about, you know, what's the role of an education institution in society? And does that need to change? You know, are the things that are happening broadly, if we look around us, are they being best served by the way we currently do an education? And really actually then who has capacity to fix these problems? I think we're in, an, in a particularly challenging time right now. And I know, you know personally, I've, I've really faced some, um, you know, like I, I kind of feel this like immense weight of all of these things that are going on in the world, you know, between COVID, economic trouble, climate change, and so on. You know, there's a lot of pressure. And I think, you know, trying to put all of our eggs in an education basket maybe isn't the answer. The UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are a really interesting one to look at for some of the major issues that are going on in the world, but also worth acknowledging that the UN itself is partially responsible for some of this cultural imperialism. But it's like we can we can sort of see, you know, the pandemic's done a lot of damage in terms of um, progress and economic um, equity and, and things like that. Um, inclusion, job losses, um, even though there's an assertion that economic recovery is underway, I think that really everybody, particularly students, you know, I mean, you tell me, but you know, there are real pressures uh, of the economy on younger people, particularly, um, and those who aren't from that established middle class or a, a ruling class background. 
And of course, education, particularly if we think about countries that are not in that sort of first world bracket, has really gone backwards because of COVID. And I was um, listening to a podcast this morning where they were talking about um, how, you know, for disadvantaged students, even in Australia, during um, remote learning during COVID, were, um, you know, for every two months of uh, learning that they did remotely, they lost a month of their education. Whereas for students with a more stable financial background, you know, they um, actually advanced further um, during their remote learning because their parents were more involved. Oh, my kid's not learning. Okay. Um, so we've got all these problems. And I'm sorry, I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd. Um, we've got all these problems. Um, but what about a second breakfast? Um, so what can we actually do here? And I think one of the major issues to cultural change, and I'm sorry, this is going to sound very Marxist, is the means of production or reproduction. So who actually is controlling the tools, the knowledge, the curriculum? And I think as student reps and as student partners, there's been a real shift. And that started in the 1960s with a lot of student activism. And it it kind of narrowed down and disappeared a little bit through the 90s. And now it's coming back with a real vengeance, particularly thinking about um, student partnership spaces where students are perhaps more able to negotiate curriculum rather than just playing by the book. But I think if we step up a level more broadly, those tools, those powerful tools of what an education is, does, and can do, we can actually take away from higher ed. It's like, once you start to be able to teach something, um, I'm going to stop this gift because that's driving me batty. Um, <laughs> once we start to be able to take some of those tools of learning and teaching and apply them in other spaces, we can really start to communicate impact ourselves. I know that's a really kind of neoliberal term, but it's like actually we can have an immense change in our communities by borrowing the learning and teaching that we do by being either representatives or being partners or being engaged in political and civic discourses. And I think it's really important for those of us in privileged positions, and I think arguably everybody in higher education to varying degrees is in a position of privilege. It's up to us to be able to, to repurpose what we've learned, what we know, how we work together, and share that with other people who maybe aren't quite so advantaged. But I also really want to get at who acts and who gets to act. And I'm going to, again, sorry, theory, revisit Gramsci for just a second. He noted that while, again, while he was in prison, that a great number of people weren't acting when they had the power to and they might in conversation be able to engage in dialogue you know perhaps like we are now about some of those social problems about some of the big big challenges that were going on in his time they were really serious problems like people were being executed because they didn't agree with the the ruling uh, the ruling order in our time it's a little bit less um, direct but people weren't, um, weren't actually taking their values, the things that they believed in and actually taking a stand for them. But he also acknowledged implicitly that there were problems in that, in that people who came from the backgrounds that were most likely to notice that inequality and disadvantage were the most likely to be persecuted for speaking out. But I think of, a, of an example, um, when I was serving on academic board at my university, um, I remember having a, one of the members of academic board was a professor who taught me. Uh, and he was really, um, he was very quite like quite radical, almost like I'm being with you now in, in this thinking um, and would really engage in these high quality discussions in tutorials. But when a series of changes came through to cut courses, to look at the university's response to job ready graduates, for example, and to look at changing fee structures for arts education, he totally made the case for those changes. Like he was like, yeah, this is gonna be really good. It's gonna push students into STEM. And it's like, but you have all these radical ideas. You're, you're an arts, you're an arts and social sciences educator. And you've just made this complete opposite case to what you would perhaps teach me. And I think that hopefully many of us who have served in those representative positions might be able to go, I can think of a time where somebody who really should have um, you know, done something differently, who really should have acted, hasn't. And I think that this is a really big problem for us, but it's something that we can, again, it's something we can chip away at. And so I think it's, you know, it's just a just throwing out more problems. All right, I've got a cognitive overload slide. I know I'm really, I'm really bad with slides. I've just put way too much on here, but I'm going to break this down. 
So just to recap, our framework so far has been, we've thought about responsibility, like who can act, who gets to act, why do people act on things, you know, what gets them to think and work in certain ways. There's problems for implicit consent from those that are probably in the most secure position, so those that are in those sort of um, more ruling positions or have more power. There's challenges for the role of education as a space of reproduction, but also there's some benefits in education spaces to really challenge and change how we think and work. There's new conceptions of the role of activism, which are often from marginalized groups and activism itself is often marginalized as a tool. And then there's a real pastiche where all of these things come together and often they come together in a higher education context. We've also sort of talked around or talked through that COVID-19 has brought us a lot more challenges. You know, higher education has taken this opportunity to really push itself into being more of a business model. We've seen job ready graduates legislation come through. We've seen um, employment for students and staff becoming more precarious. Um, educational narrative moved away from engagement. It moved away from that discussion of partnership, representation, active participation, and back into this really dated view of education as a quality instrument. So thinking about, you know, does, does, does your education do this yes, no, rather than, you know, what's the conversation to unpack there? Equity and access to services, work, education, all kinds of things suffered. And I know, again, preaching to the converted. Globally fascist and authoritarian power rose, imperialist, imperialist and racist tendencies amplified. Um, governance and decision-making became more difficult for us to access, not just in, in higher education, but also you know, more broadly um, by you know, being locked in our homes, all decisions were made about us without us. Um, radicalism has, I would argue, continued to suffer. Um, and then there's continued attacks on the sort of mainstays of student organization and student power in the forms of changes to, or proposed changes to student services and amenities fees, and you know, dismissals of um, student associations, guilds and unions and things like that too. So uh, doom and gloom, but I want to try and put a more positive spin moving forward. And I know that some of these questions will carry forward across um, this, this two days. Uh, and so, I'm, you know, I, I think that this is going to be a, hopefully not too much of a um, sad start to what's going to be a really energizing two days. Um, so rethinking higher education to stimulate active participation in learning and in governance, I think is the key role of how we think about and envision education moving forward. Students and staff working together in spaces like representation, in spaces like partnership, really start to move against divisive, profiteering and dogmatic systems, which are not only emerging, but have existed for quite a long time now. But can we actually stop some of these bigger changes? And I think one of the other big questions that I keep hearing, both from academics and from students, is where's the outrage? It's like we see things like course cuts and students go up in arms about, you know, I was studying that, that was really important to me. You know, we see protests and we see um, letter writing and responses to vice chancellors and deputy vice chancellors and other leadership in universities and institutions. Uh, but academics are saying, you know, where's the outrage from students? And it's like, what's the disconnect here? You know, what's stopping um, university staff, TAFE staff? What's stopping teachers and students together communicating? Like, why, why is there a barrier there? And is the barrier just this as we are now? Is it this screen? Um, or is it that, you know, some, for some reason, we're not able to communicate with each other? I keep hearing of a supposed apathy in educational contexts. But I kind of always ask when, particularly when staff ask me, you know, well, why are the students so apathetic? I go, well, actually, have you tried talking to them? Because I don't think that they are. But there's some kind of disconnect in this really sort of bleak landscape. And I think the more that we can work together, be collective, the better. Tiny, tiny, tiny bit more theory. And then I will stop with theory, I swear. Um, there's this work that had been done historically around, you know, where do student activists go? Where do those traditionally um, quite vocal, quite noisy students end up? Um, and often it was in the social sciences. And, you know, there's been sort of broad, a broad attraction for, you know, psychology, social work, sociology, the arts, and so on 
for students that were potentially more supposedly more switched on to social issues whereas other students went into fields like engineering nursing lawyering doctoring these aren't real words um and the, the professions because of their really packed curriculums um didn't so much lead towards a conception of education that enabled them to really engage with those big social problems. And I think that's a huge detriment because it's a big portion of the population who go through a higher education, who get pushed out of those bigger conversations about decision making, about thinking and so on. And so I think that this really, I hope, is a dated conception of the way that we think about what a higher education is and does. And can an education be different? Well, yes, absolutely. And so if we think about it, this is just one model of many hundreds of different models um, that helps us to think a bit differently about the way that we might approach, for example, a professional education. So, you know, be, a, be you a teacher, be you a lawyer, be you a doctor. We can see that there are a range of different discourses, discussions, different ways of thinking going on around us, and that maybe the social sciences gives us one particular lens on that, but also so does the sciences, so does the, the medicines, the health, the, the engineering, the mathematics, they all give different perspectives. And actually, at the nexus of all of this is the way that we teach. There's different narratives, contexts, ways of knowing, learning and doing that are all around us in university educations. Unfortunately, they just don't quite come together all the time, though we are moving in that direction. But if perhaps we can bring people together to combine some of these discourses, some of these narratives about, you know, economics and the way that the world functions that way. So the business school, for example, you bring together the technologists, the people who think about, you know, how do we make life better for people by using technology? We bring together some of those um, sociocultural ways of thinking and working and doing. And we combine that in a pedagogical approach that really values both student contributions and the contributions that came historically from all different schools of knowledge, not just the Western white episteme, but all of the knowledge systems that brought us to the point we're at now, perhaps through an education that's the rethought, we can create, I'm, I'm not going to even say this word, we can activate, I'm set up, we can activate each other um, and create a new shared endeavour, again, uniting on particular values. I don't think in this instance it's down to just the activists. I do think there's definitely a role for activism, particularly when things are really bad. And I think in spaces like, um, you know, Aboriginal deaths in custody and Black Lives Matter and things like that, you know, we really do need to push against this in a serious and sustained way. But in other instances, what we've seen because of these activist movements is only really gradual change, but overall stasis, particularly for our higher education institutions. But if we collectively, and if the 37 people in this call right now and the people that watch this later and all of the students out there, along with all of the staff out there, got together and really thought about, well, what is it that's bringing us together to think about the world? You know, what is it that I, as, you know, a future carpenter, a future lawyer, a future social scientist, what is it that I'm really trying to achieve? If we came together and rethought this collectively and rethought the purpose of higher education, we could create change in that civil society block. In that sense, I think we're all in this immense position of privilege, again, acknowledging some more than others, and some are conditioned to be able to act more than others, uh, and some won't act more than others. Even if we don't feel like a collectively, you, we have the power, but really it's only together. And I think there's a lot to be said for finding ways of conferencing, coming together. And so again, you know, days like today are really important for coming together and having those, sharing those conversations. But we're not quite there yet. And we're probably a long way off, but I think that this two days is going to be a really good way to start a conversation about, well, how do we challenge this space? How do we think about equity and diversity? How do we think about the structures of capitalism which are failing us right now? How do we think about civil society, political society? How do we think about the ruling class? How do we make change? How do we transform our institutions? And even how do we just think about our curriculum? How do we go beyond our university or our TAFE context? How do we engage with people out in the world that haven't got access to the educational tools that we have? I think there's a lot of power in that sort of sharing and thinking together.
at the moment, higher education is protecting in itself. It's got this sort of like closed walls thing going on where it's enshrining corporate management practices and projects. It disempowers students and academics. It's got protocols and principles of partnership, critical education and project-based learning, multidisciplinary thinking and things like that that are existing in pockets, but really they're being eroded because of a political narrative about quality, a political narrative about producing job-ready graduates and so on. And so I think um, as, a, as a sort of a collective, we can move forward and we can find new ways of reforming our education structures, fixing things like systemic racism, which can be fixed. It's just going to take a lot of work. <laughs> Things like sexism, again, it's going to take a lot of work. Things like ableism are going to take a lot of work, but actually active, democratic and fulsome participation from everyone that, are, that is actually valued, respected and reciprocal can lead to big change and can lead to a better society together. At the moment, we haven't kind of decided collectively what the big issue is that we want to face in our, in our higher education context. So there's a lot to be done. And I think that there's a lot of thinking and, and possibility here. I don't think that this is a negative space at all. I think that there's a lot that we can still do. So my sort of final question, and I'm sorry, this has been more questions and more sort of negative thinking than it has been um, positive and uplifting news. But I think, again, huge space of potential. My question to you is, how, how are you going to fix it? And I guess that's the question of the day two more things and then I promise I'm, I'm done. So I just want to say, be proud of what you know, be proud of where you are and how you got to be where you are. Um, always acknowledge where you came from, how you got here uh, and what you do, how you work. And don't be ashamed and don't ever be um, sort of, you know, downtrodden by broader narratives and things that sort of push you into a certain space, a way of thinking and working. And also never accept at face value what somebody else is telling you, be that a, a lecturer, be that, uh, you know, anyone, anyone, never just accept what they say. Always think about what's the power dynamic here? Who's saying this and from what position and why and how? And what if we challenged this way of thinking? Even if we only do things gradually, we all have the power collectively to really challenge the institution and to challenge society because Fortunately, we're all in a democratic um, civilization here in Australia, um, or at least it purports to be. Um, and so we have a voice, we have power. Um, and being a troublemaker doesn't always have to get you in trouble. And last slide. I just wanted to pull a quote from the fabulous Brie Lee, um, whose book, Who Gets to Be Smart, I strongly recommend to people. But she says, people think history is carved on a tablet, but it's more akin to chalk on a blackboard. Depending on who's standing at the front of the room, the lines can be rewritten or even erased altogether. So my provocation is let's rewrite the blackboard. Let's use those educational tools, those power structures, those systems that we have to create transformative social change. And if from your position of leadership, yes, you, regardless of what kind of role you serve, even if you're just a student, which I think is an incredibly powerful space to be in anyway, if you can work out a way to make a lasting difference for everybody, if you can communicate what you know to other people, if you can help even one person understand the tools and structures and systems of the world and of higher education, then you've made a positive change. And even if you just get through, even if you just live your life, you have made a positive and lasting impact. If you do happen to work out how to solve all of these problems over the next two days or the coming years, please let me know. I'm really happy to work on this journey um, together collectively, um, but it takes us all together. Again, I think this message of unity is really where I'm sort of seeing us. Um, that, that's, that's where we can make a real change. And it's when students say something and staff listen that the institution can actually make a change. So you're incredibly powerful. You're all excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. Um, and thank you for listening. And I'm really sorry about all the theory and the words and all my slides. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that amazing keynote, Aidan. Um, you've shared a lot of information and a lot of interesting and thought-provoking information. And I'm sure that there'll be some questions for you. How about we kickstart a quick q &A session. Um, if we can all turn our cameras on and raise our hands to ask questions, that would be incredible. You'll see a little reactions button down 
um, on your Zoom session. So if you just click that and raise your hand, we can ask some questions or you can also feel free to pop it into the chat um, and we can read it out for you. We've got our first question by Jin. Go for it, Jin. Uh, hi, Aiden. Thanks for the keynote. It was really uh, inspiring from the eyes. So for me, this is my second time at university. My first instance was about 20 odd years ago. So I remember being involved in um, SRCs back 20 years ago where it was common to have a sit-in or a, a protest back then. Um, I guess uh, you really start to see those when, as you were saying, when things are at that critical point, when something's really bad and really... And I guess in ways... Uh, um, I guess what, what, for the back history, for those who aren't aware, voluntary student unionism happened about 20 odd years ago where it wasn't compulsory to join your uh, your your union and wasn't there to... So what actually happened there, a lot of funding uh, went away from student organisations to fund services and fund advocacy and things like that. So that, that was one of the reasons why I was involved back then was because there was that critical time we, where we really lost our ability to have our voice. Um, a lot of universities still decide to keep some sort of SRC there because they realise that it does need an advocacy role. And I think it's really important for us to realise that um, no matter what our role is, as you say, there are ways that we can get involved in the decision making process. And I think that's critical. You don't have to be, we're all advocates in some form, but you don't have to stand up and protest or in the physical sense as such. Um, I know some of us might be a bit uncomfortable with that because we don't know the consequences around mm -hmm. things like um, if, you, if you're an international student, for example, you may not feel comfortable uh, uh, cleaning on a soapbox because you don't know whether that's going to impact your visa, etc. I guess, and have you got some ways for uh, for those for us who may not feel comfortable uh, sort of cleaning up on a soapbox and way to be involved? Um, yeah, good question, and and really uh, appreciate that um, that background as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I think yeah, it, look, I think things like um, the the sit in or even even the teach in, I think, is a powerful tool in that space. So um, you know, having having bringing yourselves into a collective space and getting someone to talk to you, or just talking to one another about what issues are actually going on. Um, is a really powerful way to sort of move things forward in a sense. So I think that's that's sort of one of those ways. I, you know, I, I think you basically answered your own question. So yeah, no, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jin. Um, we just had a question in the chat as well. What is the symbolism of calling a First Nation person aunt or uncle, um, asks Christina. So that's a that's a good question. I don't think a question for me necessarily. Um, I, in fact, I'm not sure that I really have the authority to answer. Um, but it is. I mean, yeah, it's good. Good question. It's just that for those of us of older generations, um, being made to call unknown people when we were younger aunt and uncle did not set up a good vibration for us. So therefore calling an Aboriginal First Nation person, whatever, aunt or uncle, I think for me, it's inappropriate. So that's why I wanted to know why people are now calling unknown people of different ethnic backgrounds, uncle or aunt. Yeah, I think there's a there's a there's sort of a, a there's a cultural reason in language there that um, is worth is worth unpacking. You know, you, you're absolutely right. There, there's some implications there. Um, and I think, you know, particularly when we think about Aboriginal English as a 
Um, it's like a reappropriation of English from um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, you know, using English as a, as a sort of a tool to communicate. They kind of change the meaning of some words. And, and so perhaps it's it's one of those, but again, I'm not really sort of in a space to be able to answer, sorry, but yeah, good. It's a good, it's a good question. Yeah, thanks for um, that question. Oh, hi. Hi, Aiden. Um, this is Divya. I'm from Holmes Glen, so I'll be bringing that TAFE perspective uh, into the discussion. And I have um, studied Diploma of Nursing. I'm doing my bachelor's at the moment. Um, my question, I've served in SRC for almost two years now. And all through my experience in different roles, what I've come across is TAFE caters to different courses for different durations. I know we are talking more in tertiary education perspective, but I've seen a lot of um, hesitation around bringing your raising your voice or bringing an issue in because your course is not necessarily for a longer period of time. Some might be studying there for a few weeks and some like myself would be four years. So there's a lot of hesitation around why should I raise my voice? Um, I'm just done here for six months. And that has, we have come across a lot of issues, but we've not had been able to get students to actually come up and talk about it. Is there a way to approach it? Um, like give, like I've always talked about giving them that importance, you know, regardless of what you, the duration of your courses, your voice is important. But we've had that, hesitation around students a lot mm. yeah it, and is it, it it's a that's a really interesting and challenging problem um and i know like i think you know every student that i so when, you know when i was a rep every student that i ever spoke to always kind of had something if you if you probed enough you know like if you kind of like dug into the conversation long enough you could kind of get them to say you know i faced this or i faced that but yeah, many times they didn't sort of feel enough attachment that they wanted to to sort of act, or you know, even felt that that might disadvantage them in a sense. Um, and I think that's a it's a long-standing problem. And I'm sorry, I don't have any wisdom. Um, no, I. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a good question for the day as well. I think you know, like it's a good thing to sort of for other people maybe to to come together and think about. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think, Divya, if I can just say as well, the, the interesting thing about student voice is that often it gets associated with um, talking about negative things. And so sometimes when you hear, you know, we want student voice or we want to, you know, particularly if you hear anything that Student Voice Australia does, you know, how can we get students involved and how can we tackle some really challenging issues and these kinds of things? Student voice doesn't necessarily have to sit in the place of giving feedback on what's wrong with the institution. Student voice can also be about participating in making something that's good better um, or acknowledging what's working and let's do more of it. And particularly in your context, I think it's interesting to think about it in those kinds of terms. How do we how do we um, capitalize, lack of a better word, on um, what's good about the TAFE model or what's good about the experience um, for for you guys in that context as well? So I think that that's one way to kind of shift that. How you engage students in your context? Hundred percent. And like Jin brought it up, and it is a good thing because I've experienced it experienced it firsthand me myself being an international student and talking to other international students i've come across the fear of oh it is it is quite ironic it's funny that they say oh what if my visa is threatened in that case if i were to talk about an issue and that's why it leads to more negative implications of you know being involved in the student body i think it's it's good time that we revised the model um to see to, to how we communicate to a broader range of students. It's all about the communication and changing, tweaking those terminologies that we use around. Very interesting discussions. Um, Jacob, would you like to ask your question next? Sorry, I was just doing the um, lower hand part because I know I'm very good at uh, leaving my hand up and then we have three questions in it. I was like, oh, did you? Yes, yeah, so. Sorry about that. Um, I guess I wanted to talk more about the, I guess, the apathetic student and how that's kind of, um, well, it's interesting as a bit of a, a, a narrative that is being dealt around students that we're getting told that students are apathetic, they're not engaging with change. And it's it's sometimes seen that we don't engage in such public displays of, of change like sit-ins, teach-ins, marches, protests, rallies. 
but I wonder what can be kind of said to the piece of students becoming a bit more transgressive in their way of engaging with disagreements or engaging with, you know, the system that is and wanting to show change in a different way. Because we've definitely seen it in our institution that students are less interested in getting up and protesting, but are more interested in kind of challenging in a more, um, well, I guess in a, in a transgressive way that doesn't particularly state at the front that we're being anti-authoritative and we're being outwardly challenging, but we're trying to engage a bit of a conversation around these matters rather than challenging them at the forefront. So I wonder kind of what are other people's experiences with that and kind of what's what's your your take on that, I guess, social shift? Yeah, it's, it, 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 that's really interesting. And another great question um, for the day, Jacob. Um, I think that the, there is, again, like it, it's all these different permutations of what is, you know, an activist response, I suppose. And I think, yeah, and it, there was a comment in the chat um, before around that apathy sort of being almost driven um, as a way to divide um, students and staff from coming together collectively. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about as well. Um, I, absolutely. I kind of think, you know, for me, it's that, you know, like the, the students who don't engage in that sort of traditional sense, they're, they're being more, who are being more transgressive. It's like there's actually an opportunity, you know, as somebody who works with a lot of academic staff, it's like something that I would encourage them to actually go and engage with. Like if, the, if there's a student who's, deliberately disengaging and doing things that are, you know, sort of challenging the norms and the ways of working, don't label them as a bad student, but actually there's, they've probably got something important to bring to the conversation. You know, there's something there that's that's really important that you need to give some airtime to and, you know, maybe give some extra support to. Um, so I think that there's an interesting sort of challenging space there of between the what's the activist transgression and then also what's the way that you know, the, the university or the TAFE or the whatever educational institution needs to adapt to be more inclusive and open to different perspectives. So yeah, my, another, that's a really great question again. Jin, did you have another question? Um, I was just, it was, it's a comment as well, it's a question as well. I just wondering, because uh, as, uh, as I think what the you were saying about how for a lot of students we are here for the short term we're not we're not unlike the rest of the university where you've got academics and uh, those are there there they've been there they might be there 10 15 20 years for example uh, an average lifetime of a student might be three to four years at a tertiary level in TAFE it might be six six months or whatever etc I guess one of the things is whether we need to reframe our is that why we're getting poor engagement? Because we feel that we're not here for long enough. So anything we raise isn't actually going to be change in our lifetime at that institution. But whether we need to reframe it in such a way that our actions don't... We all say we want to see something happen now, but uh, what we do now could impact students five years, 10 years down the track, which has a greater impact overall. And I just wonder whether there might be a better way to reframe things to say that we don't necessarily see the solutions overnight. If, if, if that comes across, whether that might be a better way of trying to uh, raise engagement and uh, to, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, um. I think, yeah, it, it it comes back to that chipping away, right? Like it's like that, what, you know, how do we make gradual change over time and institute cultural shifts? Like if we see one of the issues that we have is that we're not able to get that engagement in a, in a say, an SRC or a, um, in a representational body of some kind, you know, it's like, how can we actually set the culture up in those spaces to include more voices and, and you know, bring more people in so that in the future the culture is reset such that everybody feels like they can bring their their constructive criticism or their you know I think we could do things differently kinds of voices into the fold so yeah I think that there's real potential in that it's just a it, it is it's a it's a long-term game rather than a right now thing yeah another question in the chat 
Georgia asks, um, you spoke about being in representative positions and individuals not wanting to put their jobs on the line. Do you believe the fear of retribution is one of the main contributing factors for decisions that cater um, to the majority? And do you believe that this fear will ever disappear? Yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think there's this, um, there's this real fear that even people in positions of power and privilege have. And I, and I don't think, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of explicitly saying that reps, you know, like student reps aren't calling things out because I, I think it's unfair to expect, particularly in certain governance positions. Um, and I know I've talked to a lot of students about this um, during my PhD. Um, you know, there's absolutely no room for a student to even literally emit a sound from their body um, in, a, in a committee setting, um, because that's not what you're there for. You know, you're there to just be a smiley face nodding along. Um, and so I think, you know, for students, there's a whole different raft of issues. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, for staff who have sort of a, a somewhat vocal or at least an ideological perspective that should be helping us to push things into a better new collective direction, um, yeah, I mean, there is a fear of, you know, losing your job or being ostracized or what have you. But I think that's that's something that they need to learn how to do. And I think it's something that um, student partners, student reps, student activists actually do really well. Like it's something that, you know, you have to learn as a as a student engaging with an institution. You've got to learn the language. You've got to learn the discourse. You've got to be part of those conversations. And it's like, how did you get to be a professor without learning how to to do that yourself, you know, it's a really interesting thing to me to think about that. So it is about, I think it's it's a skill and it's something that I think really we've basically as universities, we have failed to work on that collectively of actually letting alternative perspectives really be discussed even like they don't, we don't have to adopt new ways of working, but even let's just talk about them because that's really the promise of e even if it is only white Anglo historically knowledge that we've talked about and debated, it's like actually the university should be a space of debate and discussion and ho hopefully idealistically of many different knowledge types and systems. But it's like if we're not doing that even in our decision making context, well, then really we've already become a business and it's that's really quite sad. So, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, long winded answer, but I absolutely agree. Um, Priya, I see your question in the chat as well. Is this something that you might want to speak about as well? Hi, Aidan. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just wondering whether it's there's a divide with people not knowing that they can voice their opinion, especially to vice chancellors or pro vice chancellors, um, and also in regards to um, like being able to speak to your MPs, like MPs are supposed to work for us, they're supposed to work for the people, but in a lot of ways there's a divide where people don't realise that that's something, an avenue that they can take. So if awareness around that these channels are available um, would impact um, the student voice being, uh, I guess, uh, people being able to use their voices more clearly or knowing that they can voice opinions. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that, you know, I guess in my ideal world of a, of a higher education, um, like in, in, a, in a program um, of study, you know, with a series of courses, several of those would be about, you know, how do we engage with political discourse in, in our given field, but also broadly, how do we apply lessons of, you know, it's like we're always talking about, you know, learning objectives or learning outcomes and you know how are we going to demonstrate xyz skill and now increasingly how are we going to authentically represent that in an industry context it's like what about how do we talk about this as a problem to stakeholder groups and how do we then take that to being you know we're studying you know like as you study anything that you study you as you're working through the content you know reading a reading or you, you know listening to a lecture you always hear about problems and it's like, then you go away and write an assignment about it and that assignment disappears. And it's like, what if rather than that, we actually decided on ways to take action on an issue that we discussed um, and put that into practice? I don't know that we're going to get there in a hurry, but it's something that I think, again, we can chip away at of that, you know, like how do we actually engage with political systems? How do we engage with university or TAFE systems? How do we have our voices heard? Um, but I also think there's a real role there, and I'm just going to throw it a piper here, on um, having a, like a student network event where you talk about what are some of those avenues for 
you know, communicating your knowledge of issues in a broader and sustainable, more impactful way. Just as a thought. Maybe I'll uh, take this opportunity to throw back to Jacob. Um, but yeah, I think that something like um, our student network sessions that we run. So for those of you who aren't familiar, we have these um, regular informal um, sessions throughout the year um, that are student led and student centered and it's an opportunity to kind of put pressure on some of these ideas and to engage with each other. And I think um, that kind of open dialogue is really important. It's not knowing um, or not having the intention to do anything can sometimes spark um, some of those ideas and I guess, you know, maintain that sort of dialogue is really important. Jacob, do you want to add to that and then ask your question? <laughs> I'm going to handball. Uh, happily, I just um, trying to echo if any student here is not a part of that, I would highly recommend you can sign up via the SVA website. It's just put in your emails and then you get added to the list and you'll get notified uh, when they are being held. Highly recommend. But I do think it is good because it kind of gives us all a bit of a chance to go in a, well, it's, you're in a jury of your peers in that moment and you're kind of surrounded by like-minded individuals there's sorry piper not many staff around us that can kind of pressure us into not saying what we mean or kind of using very coded language which dilutes the message so it makes it really quite a good time to be able to go hey actually i've been experiencing xyz has anybody else experienced this brilliant what have you guys done and it can be really that quite a kind of grassroots kind of approach to it because we're instead of being able to just chit chat with well, it gets higher ups that kind of want certain KPAs to be met and want, sorry, KPIs to be met and certain stakeholders to be happy. When we're all students sitting around as other students, it kind of breaks down those barriers. Um, so highly recommend. Um, I'm looking at doing one about policy and engagement with students in policy because it's it's a massive issue. And um, unsu well, surprisingly to me, not many people are actually interested in the, polit uh, the policy of an institution and how that affects students' engagement with the institution. I think it's fascinating. I wish everyone else did, but it's kind of how do you shift that? Um, but yeah, um, I can gush on for longer if you'd like, but I'll, I'll pull up. Um, so my question was, I kind of wanted to touch on the corporatism piece of the university because I'm quite fascinated by corporatism and corporatist theory, um, especially when it comes to institutions of power and universities are an institution of power, they're an institution of knowledge and um, don't know who said it, but very famously quoted, uh, knowledge is power. So we all, you know, are engaging with this institution. But I, I wonder, um, well, I guess for context, I sit on our university council. So I work as a council member for the university. So I have to think of the university in a very business context. It becomes very much, uh, how do we meet KPIs? How do we ensure stakeholders are happy? How do we increase revenue? How do we ensure that we're managing our risks? How do we comply with implicit um, rules from Texo or from the Auditor General. And that kind of thinking about the university is not something that all students engage with. So I, I wonder if there is the ability to kind of split the university into its two factions of the corporate and the corporate side of the university because you can't quite remove the business element and then sticking to the quite academic and well, the knowledge and the freedom space of the university. Because I often find that most universities can't quite deal with that dichotomy and haven't found the perfect middle ground. Yeah, yeah, um, really, it's a really interesting space. Um, I think also there's, um, yeah, that, that, I, I like that idea actually of kind of splitting the institution. I kind of think, um, you know, we've got institutions that were established as, you know, universities particularly were established as acts of parliament and most of them have just recently uh, done a bit of a survey of all of the founding acts of universities, but most of them um, have throwaway mentions to things like social justice, and they say things like, you know, ensuring equity and things like that. And lots of those were amendments later on. Um, and I think that that's really interesting because I think that should drive those values, even though they are a little bit throwaway in things like university acts. I think that they should actually drive the conversation that's happening in a council setting. So yeah, like, absolutely, you know, you've got to comply with tech so you've got to apply with regulation you've got to apply with auditing and financial requirements but at the heart of those things I think universities are in a particular position to be able to do that in a different way than a private company is fundamentally because they are government bodies sort of uh, even though they're allowed to act as more uh, more of a corporate entity um, so yes I think challenging those issues in that space is yeah it, it's definitely sort of almost like aside to what happens in the academic sphere but I think because they're so intrinsically connected 
that yeah it, it becomes a question for me of well how do you get every student to engage with that thinking of you know the institution is being run like a corporation it is being run by someone who's basically a ceo who's usually on over a million dollar salary and you know complies with all of these particular ways of thinking and working um and can we actually have a conversation with that person um and can we you know bring some of our again can we bring some of our academic thinking to bear in that corporate space while considering that, yes, it's obviously got responsibilities, rights, and reasons for doing what it does. So yeah, no, great question. And um, probably one for a much longer conversation. <laughs> did you have a follow-up question, Jacob? I did, and um, I'll, I'll leave it to this one because it's something I could talk about for hours. Um, I really enjoyed this topic and have spent many, uh, many a uh, what others would call long nights, but I call fight fun nights reading about this. But um, it's quite interesting because it's quite accepted along corporate spheres and it's quite the the conversation, I guess, the cornerstone of most, cor most corporate settings that uh, are fish rots from the head down. Um, although that is not correct when you come to fishing, um, I guess it is how do you kind of change that corporate culture piece when even at like very basic governance training that we're provided as council members, and maybe this is going outside of, I guess, the SRC setting, but even at SRC settings that the SRC is, or well, not so much the student unions or anything that is kind of independent from the university is subsidiary and kind of to serve the university's purposes. So I guess, how do we inject those more student focused and more transgressive and a definitely more academic conversations into council? Because that's kind of where we make the change. And if you can't shift it at council, um, sorry, everyone, it's quite glum for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Um, I look, I, and I think there's an element of top down and bottom up there as well. Like, I, I don't think it's completely hopeless at the ground, but yes, you're right. It does absolutely have real impacts about what's happening on the ground, and and that strategy piece, um, particularly if we think about things like increasing precarity for employment of staff in universities and um, higher higher education systems generally. Um, you know, it's like it's very hard to convince, um, you know, a teaching staff member to do something radical and different that's a bit off script when their institution has literally told them this is the way you like thou shalt do this. Um, and so, yes, it, it's a real challenge. I think, um, you know, it, it's again, it's about those sort of spaces of being able to find the little ways to chip away. And, you know, one of the things that, so in my time, so I was at Flinders as a student. Um, and one of the things that happened there was the, um, the student rep on council managed to um, sneak in to the strategic plan for the, you know, the next five years of the institution's operation, managed to sneak in both that student voice and student partnership are on the agenda for um, both decision-making and governance, um, but also in terms of learning and teaching, um, and that students should have a, a say in, in those spaces, uh, all in this really veiled corporate, quite interesting lingo. That's also happened at a bunch of other institutions. It's by no means a Flinders exclusive, um, but it is a way of sort of, you know, having something to sort of hang your hat on in a sense of, you know, there's there's something in the strategic plan and that's the governing document for the way that we operate. You know, it's like even just getting one word or one or two words in there can really help make that, you know, a more activist, even if it's not very activist, but, you know, a more, a more free thinking, a more flexible way of working actually come to be. So I think, yeah, there's plenty of stuff that could be done and probably should be done, but, you know, small, small steps. Just another question in the chat. Um, Isha Mamul says, students at my university, Western Sydney, overwhelmingly belong to first in family to go to uni, have a low socioeconomic status background, etc. Therefore, their priorities tend to be work and simply completing their degree. How do we ensure we engage students like these? Yeah. Um, and yeah, a fundamentally very important question, I think, for all of our work. Um, it, it's a it's an interesting space because it tends to be a lot of case by case, and I really hate saying that. It but the I think it comes back to that conversation around you know like students who engage with their you know with a TAFE for only six months. You know how do we get them to be involved? It's the same kind of question. It's like students who don't have a framework or a model 
for that kind of engagement who don't expect to because they've you know gone through school and haven't had a say in the way that their school was run and then they come to a higher education provider and the higher education provider doesn't really give them a say or maybe starts to but they they still feel that sort of inherent this is not the space for me to speak um it's it's a really big challenge it's a really big problem for the way that we encourage interaction and engage with discussions and decision making and even just build a culture amongst people um, and I think it's something that you've really got to you know you've just got to sort of think about you know what kind of tools what kind of teaching what kind of education can be used to bring them on board because everybody who engages in their education at least engages in some kind of you know it may be very didactic you know teacher standing at the front of the class talking at students but if you can influence the way that that's done and inject again some of those tool, educational tools, activist tools, what have you. If you can inject some of those into that conversation and encourage your, your peers to apply that learning, you can start to create a culture whereby it's sort of more normal to engage democratically with decision making, with bigger picture problems. Um, and always, of course, you know, key lessons of, of educational theory, you know, like making, making the learning relevant, putting things in context sharing personal narrative, talking, finding people who have sort of come out of that position of, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with it, but then this thing happened. And so suddenly I started doing something about it. Um, they can be really important people to drag into your, your message as well. So yeah, again, really complex, um, really complex issues. But I think, again, it just, it just sort of takes times like this conference, you know, to sit down together uh, and, and think about, you know, ways that we can sort of encourage others to participate. Great answer. Um, and might take one final question. I see that Georgia asks, in a university setting, how do you determine what the best method to solving an issue is? Example, traditional activism roles versus following internal processes. <laughs> uh, there's a really a lot of very good questions <laughs> today. Um, look, I think there's it depends it depends on context and i think maybe this is this is a space of um even resource development um because i think you know it's like you could have you know issues that are facing um you know an equity group for example in an institution would require things like consultation working together finding collective ways forward but it, things where it's like okay now we're going to put up your fees by five hundred dollars for each course that you take for the rest of your study at this university or this TAFE um you know that would probably activate all students and so I guess it's the magnitude um would of the you know the magnitude of the the thing the challenge um sort of di directs the magnitude of the action taken but again I guess it all does come back to you know how many people do you have engaged how are people working together? Is there that culture of everybody having a voice, everybody being able to be involved and everybody having decisions, both in their learning and teaching and in their governance spaces um, before you can even actually start to ask that question. So again, great question. Um, and I think it's, you know, again, it's something that hopefully you'll talk about across the rest of today. All right. Thank you, Aiden. And thank you for your amazing question. And thank you to everyone that asked questions and engaged. Um,